All right. Hey there, guys. Welcome back to the channel. Have you ever wondered what life at sea is really like on a research vessel? Well, today I'm going to be sharing 10 things that you probably didn't know about life aboard a research vessel. Trust me, this isn't your average cruise experience. So whether you've dreamt about becoming a sea-bound scientist or you're simply just curious about life as a marine researcher or oceanographer, then this video is definitely for you. So number one is that the ship is pretty much constantly in motion. Um, you're either like traveling to your study point, uh, doing transects, so constantly moving, or even if you're sitting in one place sampling, the boat is probably still moving. So this definitely does vary on like how fast you're moving and the size of the ship. So if it's much bigger, you're gonna feel it a lot less. It also depends on conditions. So if swells are really large, then of course you're gonna be rocking much, much more. But the ship is constantly moving. And this means that as researchers, we really need to tie everything down. So in our lab spaces, we'll have like microscopes and equipment. Everything is tied down. Um, our storage containers, all of our equipment's tied with straps really well, just in case anything falls off of the shelves or lab benches um, or in the storage spaces, right? We don't want stuff or like expensive equipment, microscopes sliding off onto the floor. This would be really bad. Um, so we have to tie everything down. This means that we become really, really good at tying all sorts of knots, kind of like a random skill of a seagoing scientist, I guess. Next, this means that you always need like three points of contact when you're going up and down stairs on the boat. Um, so this just means that you're like really careful because at any given moment, you can kind of like fall or sway a little bit. Because the ship is in constant motion, this means that seasickness is very, very common. So of course, this is gonna vary like person to person and by conditions, but pretty much anyone can get seasick. Some people like a little bit more easily than others, but everyone gets seasick. The conditions just need to be right for that. And I've also heard that it's a little bit worse if your stomach is empty or if you've had a lot of caffeine. So some of the solutions to seasickness are like seasickness pills that can really help. I've also seen like patches that people wear, I think behind the ear or something. I kind of forget, but you can wear them for a few days and that really, really helps for people that are extremely sensitive to motion sickness. Just in general, if you're feeling it a little bit less, it helps to get fresh air and to look out at the horizon. Um, so sometimes like reading in your bed while it's shaking is pretty bad for feeling seasickness. So two is that we take safety very, 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 very serious. This means that you need to do certain levels of like sea safety training, fire safety training, really all sorts of training, like certificates that you need to get before going out to sea. And this really just like make sure that you're prepared for the worst. And yeah, we care a lot about safety because there's like heavy equipment and stuff. So anything can happen. It's easier when you're like tired and it's really bad when you're at sea because sometimes you're like four or five days away from land or even longer, which means you're very far away from help. There's usually a medic and like health person on board. Scientists and stuff are trained in CPR, but you're really, really far from help. So it's really important that you're taking safety seriously. We usually wear hard hats when we're working around the equipment. Steel-toed boots are really, really common and life jackets, of course, stuff like that. But yeah, safety is extremely important. And this is like something that I didn't even think of, I guess, before going out to sea for the first time. Okay, so next is like sleeping and the room situation. So usually as a like lower scientist, you're sharing a room with someone and these rooms are basically like dorm rooms, really, really small, uh, usually bunk beds, twin sized, very standard. I think usually there's a desk. So like the two people would be sharing one desk 
there's a small closet, and sometimes you even have your own bathroom, which, I don't know, can really vary. I've been in some where you have your own shower and toilet and sink and everything, but I know sometimes there's like a shared bathroom for the floor or for a certain number of rooms. So this really does vary, like depending on the research vessel. But usually you are sharing a room with one other person. I know the like higher up you get and the like chief scientists and captains and all those really important people typically have their own room or like just a much larger room but for the average like grad student, you're probably gonna be sharing. So next is like the Wi-Fi situation. So Wi-Fi is very limited at sea. You get a certain amount and I'm not really sure how much exactly, but you could go through it very, very quickly if you're like constantly connected. So I know I was always like logging in and out and yeah, doing that to kind of save my Wi-Fi. We use WhatsApp a lot because it uses less data, especially on calls than like FaceTime audio and stuff like that. But you do get Wi-Fi, you are connected not well connected and it's limited by day, but you do have Wi-Fi. And students, so like grad students and like research assistants get much less than the more important people. So like the higher up you are, the more Wi-Fi like privileges you have. And I also know on a past cruise, the Wi-Fi was limited inside of the cabin space, like where all the rooms are and everything but outside in the labs you could use as much as you want which made sense because that's probably when you were doing your lab work or when you really needed to get like some work done so that was kind of nice okay so next is like food and meals so this was something i was really not expecting or didn't really think much of but you really have to take advantage of the fresh foods like fresh vegetables and fruits in the beginning of the cruise because after a certain amount of time you notice that they start shifting to like more frozen things so like less fresh foods and they start running out of like certain ingredients and then it gets a little bit repetitive so yeah really take advantage of like all of the fresh foods in the beginning knowing this like bring some of your own favorite snacks or fruits that you like to eat because your meals are really like limited in what they have. You can bring your own food and I think that would be a really good tip if you have specific things that you like to eat. But yeah, you usually have set meal times or slots when you're supposed to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then there's also food that is just available out there like bread, fruits, little snacks, cereals, stuff like that that you can just get at any time during the day when the galley area is open. But you do have those set meal times where like everyone is going to eat so you're sitting down there at like long tables with a bunch of other people during all of your meals. I think this is also kind of funny um, that you have like set meal times because let's say you're waking up for a night shift but it's dinner time so your first meal is going to be like dinner which is kind of weird or like maybe you're just going to bed in the morning but you want to eat before going to bed so breakfast is your dinner. Uh, so that can be a little bit weird and like an adjustment for sure. So there's usually like a lot of food that you can choose from. They try to do a pretty good job of like having some sort of dessert out for you. And there's also this like small store usually where you can buy other snacks like candies, chocolate, stuff like that. Quick break. If you guys are getting any value out of this video, please give it a big like right now, leave a comment, and thank you guys so much. So next is drugs and alcohol. This is definitely something to keep in mind uh, before going out to sea. So in all UNALS vessels, which are University National Oceanographic Laboratory System vessels, there is a really strict ban on alcohol and other illegal drugs, which includes marijuana. Smoking is okay on most vessels, I believe. I know that I was on a European, so a Danish vessel, where like alcohol wasn't allowed but smoking was, and they even sold like cigarettes at a pretty high price at the little store that they had there, which I thought was really, really interesting. But yeah, that's just the way it was. I've also heard from like some other people that have been on cruises, I think like British vessels that were given like small cups of wine at dinner every night. Um, so I think the alcohol rule does vary depending on which research vessel you're going on. But for the most part, 
they're dry cruises, so no alcohol, no drugs, maybe smoking is okay. Okay, so aside from like your own room, they also have some recreation rooms or like a library. The rec room is kind of nice because they have a large selection of like books or movies. I think even like video games that you guys can play during your time off. We had some like nights where we all watched Lord of the Rings, so that was really nice. They also had a small fitness center, which was pretty small, but it at least had like treadmill yoga mats, bikes, bench press, a lot of free weights and stuff like that. It was really small, but it really does like get the job done. And I think it's really funny to like run on a treadmill when you're constantly like swaying side to side. You do get kicked off a little. So that's an adjustment. And yeah, doing push-ups against the like rocking of the boat was also a little interesting but i did really like the fact that there was a fitness center because on a cruise you really can't do much other than hanging out in your room hanging out with other people or working so this was like a nice way to take a break you can also like walk along the boat depending on how big it is but usually they're pretty small okay so next is your work schedule which can get to be pretty crazy when you're doing research and like sampling at sea and everything it's a little weird because sometimes you're on a day shift sometimes you're on a night shift so that can be really like bad for your sleep just constantly like being back and forth and not being in a set routine it can change day by day that can be pretty challenging Challenging. But of course, this is also going to really like vary on the nature of your work. So for mine, for example, we did both day and night toes or shifts, which were like seven hours of flying these nuts um, to catch our zooplankton and then like five hours of processing and preserving everything, which meant that we were working like 12 hours straight and then we'd have maybe 12 hours off. You have to like fill out a sleep log that you're sleeping a certain amount of hours because it could be, you know, like potentially a little bit dangerous to be doing this work when you haven't gotten enough sleep. But yeah, it's very tiring because you're working 12 hours straight, not sleeping enough because you probably have like other responsibilities and stuff that you have to do on your downtime. It could be really challenging if your roommate is on an opposite schedule or a schedule that like interferes with yours a little bit. And yeah, eating at weird times because you're working at weird times. Really like lack of consistency, if that makes sense. So so next is that the boat is really small and I was actually on a really large vessel but even with this large vessel like almost the size of a football field it feels really small once you get to know it and once you spend like a week on it there's only so many like new places that you can explore and you're constantly like seeing the same people around the same people having meals with all the same people and just like seeing these people 24 7 being like forced to interact and talk with them even when you're tired or like you don't really feel like being social you share a room with someone so I thought this was like a little bit challenging especially as like kind of an introvert because yeah you really have like a lack of privacy and a lack of alone time you can't go anywhere maybe you can go somewhere on the boat that doesn't have very many people but yeah you're just constantly around the same people and I found that for like five weeks it gets pretty old pretty fast <laughs> and I just like ah I'm really like craving my alone time. So yeah, that can be a little challenging depending on what kind of person you are. And lastly, I wanted to end on a more positive note, but being on the boat means that you're just like surrounded by the ocean, which is beautiful. You get really like amazing sunrises, sunsets, and the stargazing is amazing, right? Because you're just out in the middle of nowhere, no city lights, you can see the stars above you at night. And it's kind of funny because it looks like the stars are moving back and forth when in reality it's just you or the boat moving but it's so pretty and like one of my favorite parts of being out at sea. I really just love like doing work early in the morning when the sun is rising, uh, you're collecting your samples. It's really nice, but I also like working at night because it's very, very quiet compared to the craziness of the daytime. So to me, that's like one of the best parts of being out at sea. Very beautiful and quiet. 
sometimes. Okay, I really hope you guys enjoyed this video or found it like a little interesting to hear what life at sea is like as an oceanographer. If you enjoyed it, please give it a big like. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this and go check out some of our PhD vlogs where you can see what life is like when I'm not at sea. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.